Good evening, everybody. My name is Andrew Peroni, and uh, today we're going to be talking about the ABCs of landscape watering. So we're going to be covering um, some of the basics of watering. We'll get into the weeds a little bit um, on that. And then if we have some time, we'll also maybe program a station or two on a controller so you can see kind of the um, beginning to end of the whole process. Okay, let's see if I can. Okay, perfect. So we're gonna be talking about um, so the uh, watering um, and why is it important to uh, change our watering schedule? Well, in short, the answer is seasons. The plants and the lawn in your yard need different amounts of water. So depending on the time of year, uh, the water requirements are going to change. So that's why we need to understand how uh, to water properly uh, depending on the time of year and depending on what you have in your yard. So as we go through this presentation, think about your yard and what you have in your yard, what kind of plants um, and how they are laid out because we will be um, referencing that as we go along. So what are some of the things that affect water needs of plants? Well, the weather is the obvious one. Now we talk about weather. Some of the things that impact weather are the season, so the time of year, and that's because the angle of the sun is different uh, throughout the year. So the amount of radiation, solar radiation changes throughout the year. So even if temperatures are high in the winter time, it doesn't necessarily mean plants need more water than they do or the same water that they need in summer because there's fewer hours of light. Wind, of course, higher winds typically mean um, more water is needed for the plants. Um, temperature is an obvious one in rainfall. Your soil type, um, your soil condition and your cover. So if you have a rock mulch on top of it, um, that could impact some, some water needs of your plants. Your soil type, for the most part in our area, um, here in the valley, you're gonna be experiencing a clay or a clay loam soil. And that will be important as we'll mention later on to, to understand that and how that soil works. Your plant types, of course, is kind of the obvious one. Do you have lawn? Do you have uh, high water use or low water use plants? The plant size, this is important because think about where plants lose and use and lose water. So they're taking the water up through their roots, obviously, and, and then through their leaves, uh, evapotranspiration, or um, essentially think of it like uh, trees or plants are sweating through their leaves. So the higher uh, quantity uh, of leaves, the more amount of leaf surface means the plants are losing more water, which could change the water requirement as well. And then microclimate. So again, thinking about your yard, uh, if you have a, a north or south facing um, part of your house um, or you have a, a west wall um, that it gets uh, a lot of afternoon sun, uh, that's going to be impacting some of the water requirements as well. And then your maintenance practices. If you have a more low maintenance yard um, versus a yard that's maybe a bit heavily planted and you have to do a lot of trimming and pruning, uh, that's going to sometimes increase your water requirement as well. So see some of the things that are affect the water needs of your yard and your plants. So we're gonna go in and talk about uh, how to figure out exactly uh, how to incorporate these things. So I would encourage you, if you have this book, if you've seen it before, um, to uh, have it alongside you. If you have a, a paper copy, um, you can also follow online, landscapewateringguide.com. I will be referencing uh, some page numbers through this. Um, and of course, the presentation will be posted afterward as well. So if you need to go back and review some, some pieces of it. But, uh, a lot of things we're going over today um, are going to be also in this booklet. And you can request one from Chandler Water Conservation if needed. Okay, so at the very beginning, walk up to your irrigation controller, open it up, and then go ahead and close it back up and turn around and walk away. Because the first things that we actually need to know about how to water, number one, what are your plant types that we're trying to water? So we'll talk about the different plant types that are typically gonna be found here, but think about your yard, what you have out there, if it's lawn, trees, shrubs. The second thing we need to know is the watering device. Do you have sprinklers, lawn sprinklers potentially? Do you have some drip emitters? Or are you even watering some areas with a hose? So even if you're hand watering, the principles that we're gonna be talking about today will still apply to figuring out, okay, when is the right time to water? Okay, so let's start with plant types. So if you think about what are the, the most common plants that we see around here, um, one of the big ones that we see very often is warm season grass. So that's gonna be your Bermuda grass. That's typically the one that's gonna be starting to grow um, quite a bit right now. And um, if you um, 
had a winter grass over it, you're going to see it trying to poke through, or you may have intentionally transitioned that into the one that's here all summer long. Your cool season grass, if you do, do an overseed, um, this is what we're referencing when we talk about cool season. That's usually a winter rye of some kind. It's a seasonal grass. It doesn't make it in the summertime here, but the water requirements are different from the two. Desert adapted plants. So uh, do you have plants that are pretty well adapted to our area um, in our soil so that they um, are the tough ones, if you will, or are they more high water use plants that need a little bit more attention and care? So think about your yard and which ones you might have out there. And we'll talk about each of these. If you're not sure if you have desert adapted plants, I would encourage you to either pick up a copy of this brochure or you can go to that link. Um, and it's a really great resource for either figuring out the plants that you have, or if you're interested in planting some hardy plants, some desert adapted plants, uh, this is a really great resource for that. And you can request that as well from Chandler Water Conservation. Uh, or from Queen Creek as well. Uh, your sprinkler type. So let's talk about, we've, been, we've got our plants down. So now let's think about what are the sprinkler types that we have in our yard? Because this is also going to impact um, how we want to water. So first, um, a, more com a very common one is our lawn sprinkler. Um, so the other one that you'll run into pretty often is a drip emitter. And in some cases as well, you might even have tree bubblers. We'll talk about each of these um, and how you can identify them, uh, know exactly how that's going to impact your, your water um, requirement, or your, your uh, watering um, expectations. So let's start with our lawn sprinklers. So typically the one that you'll find if you have an area of lawn in your yard is going to be these six sprays. So the six sprays are, uh, or pop up, you'll sometimes heard them called. Uh, they tend to have a pretty high output of water, sometimes in that two or three inches per hour. Um, and that's important for us to know when you think about, think about a, a storm, a rainstorm. If it rained two or three inches in one hour, what would you be doing? You'd be heading for the roof of your house because the house was floating away. So that's how much these things are putting out. So it's really important for us to remember when we're programming um, or trying to figure out our water requirements um, because um, it's going to impact how quickly that water gets down and it's going to impact um, how often we need to do it. The other kind that you might have if you have a larger lawn area is going to be this either rotor on the one on the left or rotary is the one on the right. Um, the commonality between these two is they tend to have a somewhat lower output, um, not necessarily um, uh, a, a low output like a drip system, but they'll be lower than your fixed spray over a certain area. So what that means in practicality is typically these run for a lot longer. If you notice the one on the left and you see those oftentimes in an HOA or in a park, those things will be on for a very long time. And that's because they're covering a very large area. So you may have these if you have a larger lawn area. It's important to know because you don't want to run them like your fixed spray. And then of course, drip emitters. Almost everybody's going to have some form of drip emitters if you have a yard with landscape. And they're going to look like these. So the emitter itself is just the little piece on the end. Um, or it could be look like this, where that piece might be actually underground and all you see is the tube at the top. But if it's not spraying out high into the air, that means there is a drip emitter attached somewhere and it's being regulated. So the big question is what is how much how much water is coming out? What is the flow rate? So that GPH there stands for gallons per hour. And that's typically what you're going to look at to figure out how much water is coming out of this system. Typically, it's a very low output, um, which is good uh, for several reasons. Um, our plants are, especially if they're desert adapted, um, they don't require a high quantity of water, but also our soil, especially remember that clay or clay loam, if you ever dug into it, um, it can't take up water very quickly. It's a very heavy soil. So it needs water to be applied slowly, and these are perfect for that. One thing to keep in mind if you're trying to figure out if you have the right kinds of drip emitters, you want to look to see if they're labeled pressure compensating or PC for the best results. And the reason this is important is because then the stance flow rate in gallons per hour will be the actual flow rate that those drip emitters are putting out. Oftentimes you'll see drip emitters like this. If you have something like that or that in your yard, then um, I would recommend taking those out and maybe swapping them for uh, one that's labeled with pressure compensating. And the reason is because these do not 
compensate for changes in pressure. So if you have a long drip line, then the area closest to the water source is going to be more water coming out and the area furthest from the water source will be less water coming out. So it's very hard to manage. And when we're trying to figure out how much to water with our irrigation system, it's almost impossible to get the right amount of water down because each of these are putting out different amounts of water. The one on the left, those adjustable bubblers, if you have a veggie garden or a pot, those can work okay. But generally in our area, they put out water a little bit too quickly for our soil. Um, so it ends up you know, flooding it and you have some runoff. And those are notoriously difficult to manage as well as they kind of clog up. You may also have bubblers or have heard of these bubblers as well. Um, these are gonna look more like this. Uh, flood bubblers is sometimes what you'll hear them called. Um, they have actually a very high output. Most of the time you'll see these um, either under citrus trees or maybe ficus trees, um, established ones. If you have these, you wanna make sure there's a big basin around your plant so that when it turns on, it can fill up that basin and then soak in the soil. If you have one of these just on flat soil, um, after about 30 seconds, you're gonna get a lot of runoff. It'll almost look like a leak. So you don't see these too often here, but they can work, um, but just remember they're a pretty high output. Andrew, okay, so, I got a quick question for you, <laughs> so sure. it's okay. Um, so the question is, how does soaking with water, in the soil, soil of a plant in a container versus adding water to a shallow depth prevent or minimize salt burns? And then also where in the soil is the salt actually deposited? Uh, so it sounds like you're, um, the question is regarding uh, uh, applying drip irrigation um, to the soil. Is that, am I understanding that correctly? Yeah, so how does soaking soil of a plant in a container mm -hmm. versus adding water to a shallow depth prevent or minimize salt burn? Okay, so if you have a container, you're typically not gonna have to worry about salt burn if because you're having amended soil in there. Um, if you're getting burning from that, it just means the soil was amended either too much, a lot of fertilizer in there, so it just needs to be re-amended. If it, you are gonna be watering just to the depth of the pot and it's gonna be running out, so that's a different, that's a much more shallow watering, if you will. Um, it's more frequent, typically. If you have a water, you're watering plants in the ground, the benefit of watering very deeply, regardless of whether it's drip irrigation or um, spray heads or whatever is, because is part of the benefit is that you do want to push any salt if you're in an area that has a lot of calcium magnesium in the soil and you wanna push away those naturally occurring salts away from the plant root um, where they take up the water, then you wanna water really deeply because then it allows the, the water to move sideways in our clay loam soil and that helps to push away some of those, um, those salts. So hopefully that answers the question. We'll talk a little bit more about deep watering later on as well. So I'll be happy to go more in detail at the end if it's um, if there's still some questions on that. All right, thank you. Okay, perfect. So I'm gonna cycle back through here. So as we're going to, uh, one thing that's really important to remember, um, remember we're still just looking at what type of sprinklers or emitters you have out there. All the watering devices should be labeled pressure compensating or pressure regulating. Here's an example of that. Um, this manufacturer has it labeled as PRS, pressure regulating sprinkler. You can typically find if you're at the store, just look for pressure regulation on some uh, form or another. And usually it's either stamped on the device or it's on the bag or the bin that you're taking it out of, whether it's a drip emitter or a sprinkler head. And this is really important because that means that the water is going to be distributed more evenly through your system and you're gonna be able to water much more efficiently. You'll have less loss um, either through runoff or misting or, or inefficiencies because the water is getting to where we want it to go uh, more consistently. Okay, so let's take a deep breath. We have our plant type now. We know what plants we have in the yard. And now we also know what kind of sprinklers that we have, or we have a good idea of what kind of sprinklers that we have. So if we uh, think about what our yard is like, they're typically divided into stations or zones. So that means you have, uh, maybe if you have a larger lawn, you might see it turn on three different times. And you wonder, well, why don't they just have it turn on all at once? Or why don't I have one drip line that waters everything? Well, two reasons. The, the main reason you see that is because your water meter at your house is only so large, that pipe is only so large. So it can't actually push that much water through it at once. And if you tried to turn on your shower inside when it was running, you would have no water inside. So 
to solve that, divide it into zones. That's actually a real nice benefit for us when we're trying to figure out how to water because those plants actually likely have different water needs as well. So if you have a high number of zones, that's actually a really nice benefit because that means you can fine tune your watering depending on the plant types and maybe even microclimates. So when you think about your controller and you say, okay, we got plant type and we have our um, sprinkler type. And then you look at your controller and say, okay, uh, I don't see either of those on here. So how do we get that information and translate it into a watering? So we're gonna be focusing a more on these things here on the right-hand side. Oops, let me go back one, sorry. Uh, if you can see the mouse, the start times, the run times, the water days. So these things are what we're going to translate the information we've got about our yard and put it into your controller. Okay, so what do we still need to know then? It's nice that we know our plant types and we know our sprinkler types, but we still need some additional information. So we, as we looked at, the inputs of the controller are number one, what are the minutes or hours to run each station? So we need to know that. How often do we need to run? That's typically going to be under the days section. And then third, we need to know what time of day to start that. So when we're thinking about how to properly water, we need to take these, we need to translate what we know from our landscape watering by the numbers and our plant types and be able to input that into a controller so that it waters. So the first question, you can see I'm referencing that page number down there. So feel free to follow along that way uh, as well. How long do we need to run our sprinklers? Well, let's, let's talk first about sprinklers, the um, fixed sprays or, or rotors and not drip yet. So we'll, we'll focus on the lawn portion. So the best way to determine that is actually to do a quick test by placing some flat bottom cans out in your yard, turn the, the zone on and figure out how much water on average was in each can. The reason this is beneficial is because everybody's yard is a bit different. The spacing is different, the sprinklers are different. So it's hard to give a single rule of thumb uh, to say you should be running X amount of minutes because it actually is dependent on a lot of different things in your yard. So we will talk about some general ranges that you can, you can use to get started um, and some other methods that you can use if you don't have the flat bottom cans uh, to do the test, but this is gonna give you the highest level of accuracy. So what you would do is you say, okay, depending on the number of inches that fell, um, into the cans, it'll tell you how many minutes to run your sprinklers. And you'll notice on here that those minutes are pretty high, right? Even the lowest one they list on there is 14 minutes. So when you think about how long typically you see sprinklers running, it might only be maybe what, eight or 10 minutes. So the typical range that you're going to see is actually somewhere in that um, 12 to 20 minutes total. And we'll talk about how um, uh, that's gonna impact how we uh, program. So this is a nice quick guide to um, it, it general um, get started with. So if you have the sprinkler spray, the six sprays, uh, that's the one on the left. So there's an 18 minutes. Like I said, if you're starting somewhere, I would start somewhere in that 12 to 20 minute range. If you have the rotors um, with the rotating nozzle, you're gonna be at least 40 or 45 minutes um, up to maybe an hour or even 90 minutes if you have them spaced um, very far apart. So you see that under number three there, that's a really nice way to check if you are kind of starting from scratch or you need to make an adjustment um, to see if you're getting the proper watering depth. So our typical grass here is gonna be, the roots are gonna be in the range of somewhere in that six to 12 inches of how deep those roots are. So we want to maximize how deep we're watering. And one way you can test that is by pushing either a long piece of metal or a long screwdriver if you have one into the soil, um, maybe the morning after uh, you watered and see how deeply is the water penetrating into the soil. And if it's, if it's really deep and you're able to push past the handle and it's still wet under there, you're probably might be running too long. Um, and if it's only in the first um, inch or two and you can't get it past that, then you might not be running long enough. So what about drip and bubblers? Well, before we can figure out how long we need to water for drip and bubblers, we need to figure out um, how many gallons are needed to water. So when we're thinking about our individual plants, so in Arizona, we have um, what's called sparse planting, where we have plants that are individual, separate from other plants, and we have the drip emitters um, watering each plant individually or each tree individually. So we don't have a system that waters just everything at, at once, either from overhead or um, 
or something underground. So they're, they're actually watering each plant individually in their root zone. So in that case, we need to figure out how many gallons each plant needs in order to figure out um, the proper watering. And that's gonna be based on the size. So you can see the difference between trees and shrubs. Your trees obviously are gonna have much bigger canopy diameter. So they're gonna need a little bit more water. And on the bottom right, you'll see those numbers start to get really high, you know, over 100 gallons, 200 gallons. And you think about the trees in your yard, you might be thinking, oh my gosh, I have like 20, 30 foot trees. That's so many gallons. One thing to keep in mind is if you have desert adapted trees, you don't really need to get all the way up in that range. Um, well, it, it, there's additional information on this also in that watering by the numbers brochure, but typically if you're in that, you know, 60 to 80 gallon range where you can see with that 10 footer, if you have desert trees, that's gonna be pretty, pretty good for them. However, if you have citrus or ficus trees or anything that is sensitive plant, then I would stick to those higher numbers because they're gonna be a little bit more thirsty. So think about the plants you have, they might all be different sizes. Um, and so just kind of get in your head, think about, all right, which, what plants uh, do I have kind of in the, in the range of how large they are? Um, and we'll just kind of take a number for ourselves right now and say, okay, maybe if you have a three foot plant, um, you need about eight gallons. Now, this is also important when we talk about the drip emitters again. So remember we talked about pressure compensating and why was I pushing that uh, so hard? Well, that's because um, if we know the gallon per hour output, then we know that it's getting the right amount of gallons of that plant. For instance, you have a two gallons per hour coming out of your drip emitter, and you say, I need eight gallons. Then you say, okay, well, quick math tells us we need to run for four hours. And I was like, wow, that's really long, but remember, it's only two gallons per hour. But if you don't have pressure compensating drip emitters, we don't actually know it's doing two gallons an hour. So it's anybody's guess. So along those lines, if you can't find it stamped, you can estimate that as well. Um, and if, it's, if it has a lot of streaming uh, without, without dripping at all, then it might be either not pressure compensating or it might be a much higher flow rate. If you're able to see visible drips coming out, it's probably in the lower flow rate. Um, they, a lot of them are stamped, but it's really hard to see because it's kind of small. Um, so it is good to at least take stock of what you have. And at the very minimum, I would recommend unifying your drip emitters uh, because it's gonna really help you out when you're trying to um, water uh, because they're all in the same um, line or the same zone. Okay, so here's some, some general rules of thumb that we talked about um, to get you started. So again, the testing your, your sprinklers is the best way to go, but if you need to start somewhere, um, you're gonna get typically in that range of 12 to 20 minutes. And like, remember what we're talking about, you really are aiming for that six to 12 inch um, watering depth on your lawn. And that's really what you're aiming for. If you have the rotor or rotary, we talked about you're gonna be in this range. And if you have a drip irrigation that is pressure compensating, you can see that one hour or more, sometimes even up to six hours. So keep in mind, if you're only watering a, a gallon per hour at each plant, then six hours is actually not bad. Might not even be enough in some cases. So if you have really large plants. And if you have bubblers, those are typically going to be uh, on the lower end as well. Uh, bubblers, if they're on trees, you would do the same kind of math. Um, the bubblers are typically going to be stamped with a flow rate as well, and usually in gallons per minute, though, instead of gallons per hour. Okay, so now we have a general idea, or we have a really good idea of how long we need to run um, in terms of getting the right amount of water to our plants. So the next question is, how often do we need to run? So we say, okay, that's, that's great. I know I need to water somewhere in that 15 minutes of range on my lawn, but how do I need to do that every single day? I mean, it's hot here, but is it that hot? Well, this guide on page 18 of your book, um, you can also find it online. This is the frequency that you want to water. So once you've figured out how deeply you want to water, and it's really all about the roots, you wanna water really deep for those roots. If you look on the column all the way to the right here, you can see these are some of the depths that we talked about. So here on your lawn, what we talked about six to 10 inches, and then everything else is even deeper than that. So we wanna water as deeply as we can in our soil because it's that heavy soil. And then what we need to do after that is let it rest essentially. Give it some time in between before it happens again. Depending on the season, it's either more time or less time. So this is a very busy chart. Um, don't try and read it all at once. We're gonna kind of 
um, look at a couple of more streamlined ones here. So if you have grass, warm season grass is what you're mostly going to be having right now. You might still have some cool season grass hanging on because it hasn't gotten really hot yet. So really you want to think about transitioning out of that. But if you have it and you're in spring right now, once every three days, so this is the days between watering. If you have your warm season grass, that's once every four days or so. And you can see even in the middle of summer with your warm season grass only needs water about once every three days. So if you're watering deeply enough and you're getting that full root zone wet, then the lawn isn't going to use it all in one day. It's going to take at least a couple of days to use that. So this is the, the next important piece of watering just in general in the desert. Even if you're hand watering, the same ideas are going to apply. You want to water really deep and then give it some time off, not so frequent. What about trees and shrubs? Well, um, it depends if you have high water use or desert adapted. So if you have desert adapted plants, um, those are going to be able to go a lot longer in between watering than if you have high water use plants. You say, well, what if we have a mixed one where it's high and low? Well, you're typically going to have to water to the highest water using plant. If you only have one of them, you can try and stress it a little bit, and you could somewhere you could pick a range in between. So let's take an example here and say we have some shrubs. Maybe you have some hibiscus. You have like two hibiscus on your zone, which are high water use, but then the rest of them are all desert adapted. You say, well, what am I going to do? You might try once every 10 days or so and see how your hibiscus handle it. If they're established enough, they might be all right. Um, so again, think about when we talked about how long we were watering. We're watering really long run times, really deeply. Soak that soil, soak those roots, and then give it a week or more in between before watering again. Even in the summertime, you can see um, it doesn't need uh, very frequent watering. So if you've watered very heavily in the past almost every day, then you won't be able to do this right off the bat because those roots are not that deep, but you can train it. So you essentially just kind of start, um, start off slow, give it a couple days off in between, and then keep extending that to as far as you can go. And you'll be surprised at how tough our plants can be. Okay, that's great, but my controller only has a schedule for days of the week. How am I gonna stretch it out to once every 10 days? Well, that's the beauty of having these different programs, A, B, and C. Uh, we'll go into how to do uh, potentially an interval, interval. Uh, we have some time here, um, but if you only have one schedule for days and you say, well, my lawn needs it once every three days, but my trees and shrubs need it once every seven days, that's where these programs A, B, and C, if you were wondering what those are for, then you can put your other plants that need a longer time in between watering in a B or C. Um, you can have your lawn in A or vice versa, and that way you can maximize um, the, the different intervals and the efficiency of how you're applying the water to your different plants. Custom frequency for each of those programs, like we talked about. Okay, the last question um, for uh, addressing our watering is when to run. So there's another uh, setting on there that says your start times, right? So we need to tell the controller when to activate, when to turn on your um, your different um, zones to water. So if you have lawn, the recommendation is to water when it's dark, and the reason is because you want to minimize the evaporation loss from the water that's being thrown into the air. So typically um, that means you're gonna be watering either very early morning, um, maybe like even at midnight, um, or maybe the night before, uh, starting at 9 p.m. or something like that if you are um, not using that area anymore. You wanna, like we talked about, reduce the loss from evaporation. You wanna maximize how much water is actually getting into the soil. Um, if, if you, or um, someone who's moved here from uh, like the Midwest or the East Coast, you might be concerned about mold um, and say, oh, I have to water in the morning so that it can water evaporate off of the leaves in the morning. But really in the desert, if you're getting mold out there, it probably means there's just too much water in general. Um, you shouldn't be getting mold if you're watering properly. Uh, so if you're getting mold, you either have a problem with your actual soil being too com compacted, which is a different issue, but most of the time it just means there's overwatering going on. What about drip irrigation? Well, you can run it at night as well, the same for the same reason for evaporation, but a lot of it is getting right there by the plant, so there's less evaporation. So typically uh, what we might recommend is when will you see it running? So you can um, uh, program it to water um, when you might be awake and around the house or at least have it 
so that it's ending its schedule when you're awake and around the house. That way, if there's a leak, you'll see it much more quickly. So all the water that you uh, might have lost from evaporation, uh, you'll save it in that first major leak that happens, whereas if it's running in the middle of the night and running down the street for uh, weeks on end, um, it could be hard to catch it that way. Okay, so on your controller, one important piece to remember is that your start times um, or your program start time is also what you'll see it called on there is not related to the zones or the minutes. So what does that mean? Each start time will run all the zones in that program. I'll give you an example of what that looks like just so you can kind of get a sense of, this is a common um, programming error that we see out there and it can cause a lot of uh, headache and some overwatering and kind of wondering what's going on. So here's an example. Program A has a start time that shows 5 a.m., 5.30 a.m., and 6. And then the stations inside of program A, you have each, each of those is set uh, zones 1, 2, and 3, 30 minutes each. So logically, you might think, okay, what's going to happen? Well, 5 a.m., runs 1, 5.30, 2. But that's not what actually happens in these controllers. The controller, what's going to happen at 5 a.m., station 1 is going to run. Right after it, it says, oh, I have station 2. Runs that. Right after it, runs station three. Say, okay. But then it says, oh, I have a 5.30 a.m. I have a second time in there, which is now it's already 7 a.m., but it says, well, I still got to run it. So then it runs one again for 30 minutes, runs two again for 30 minutes, and then runs three again for 30 minutes. And then it's 6 a.m., which is now 8.30. And now you're getting the message that, you're getting the picture here, uh, is that the controller is going to stack the start times. So it's triple the amount of time that we intended. So just something to keep in mind when you are inputting your program into your controller, um, that you wanna make sure that each uh, program has the start time, only one start time if that's what you need. Now we'll talk about one um, instance where uh, you actually maybe wanna have more than one start time, which we'll talk about here in a moment. So the main um, thing to take away is that your controllers will stack the start times. So check your A, B, and C program and see if they have more than one start time. If they do, then it's gonna run everything in there more than once. Now, the case where you might want that is in the case of cycle and soak. So let's say for instance, we figured out on our lawn to run deeply enough, we want to water for 27 minutes total to get a really deep watering. But 27 minutes, if we run it all at once, most of it's gonna end up maybe in the street or it's just gonna turn to a big lake out there. So how do we reconcile that? Well, at our actual program on station one, let's say it's the station one lawn zone, we're going to input only nine minutes. And then you can see below that, we're going to actually break up those start times to 12 a.m. and then a second one at 2 a.m. and a third one at 4 a.m. And if you have multiple lawn zones, it'll still work for that. It'll just run them in order. So this, now you're seeing nine minutes at 12, nine minutes at 2 a.m. and then nine minutes again at four. We got our 27 minutes we've reduced our runoff. Okay, so we've covered a, a lot of ground about how we need to apply the water, um, how to figure out the right amount of water. So the key pieces of information that we've gathered is our minutes or hours to run each zone. Minutes typically is gonna be on your, your spray and rotor zones for your lawn. And the hours is typically gonna be associated with your drip irrigation how often to run. So remember really deep and then not so frequent. So typically um, you're going to give at least a couple of days off all year round. The only time you need to water every single day is if you have a, maybe a brand new plant or if you're doing a seed on your lawn. Uh, those are the only times you'll need to water every single day. Um, everything we've talked about, by the way, so far is about plants in the ground. So we haven't addressed plants in pots yet. Uh, that's gonna be um, the same idea. You just typically are gonna need to water much more frequently because the roots and the soil area is so small. And we talked about the time of day to run. Okay, so it looks like we have some time. So I'm actually gonna go ahead and um, transfer to my uh, other device here so we can um, look at an irrigation controller and then um, input this program that we've, um, that we decided we want to, um, and, and how that might look. So give me one second here while I transition this. Um, let's see if I can do that here. Let's me share the screen. 
Drew, I think it might need um, you to give access to my my iPad here. Or let me see if I can do it here. Oh, here we go. Okay, so you're going to see my screen go blank for just a sec, and now I'm going to um, let's see here if this this will work. Hopefully, this will work. Um, let's see here. Um, can I do? my screen or not perfect okay so i'm showing you here an irrigation controller so basically what we want to do is put in that program that we were just looking at um, onto the um, uh, into this timer <clears throat> so let's go ahead and i didn't um, take a screenshot of it but let's go ahead and um, um, input that program so the lawn program um, I had up there uh, is two days a week, and we're going to water it. I'll just tell you what it is, and then we'll go back to it so we can kind of look at it. Uh, two days a week, bars at 4 a.m., and um, it's going to be a rotating nozzle. So we want to run it. We've determined we want to run it for 45 minutes. So how do we get that information into here? So the first thing we're going to do is go ahead and turn this dial to where it says program start times. This particular model here, you may not have, but you, if you have a Hunter X-Core, this will be very similar uh, programming. Uh, any controller is going to have these same settings over here. So these are the ones we're going to look at and how we get the, the watering information we need into a controller. So uh, the first thing we need to put in is our start time. So we determined we want to run the zone at 4 a.m. So turn to set program start time. You can see here it's already in program A. There's the first start time. Now this can get a little confusing because that might think, oh, that's zone one. But remember what we talked about. This start time is only associated with the program, not necessarily the zone. So I'm going to hit this plus button here and take us to 4 a.m. Okay. So hopefully you can all see that okay. And then um, now we have our, our um, zone uh, set for uh, start time at 4 a.m. So the next thing we need to do is actually put in the run time for that, for that zone. So this can get tricky. So we see how it says station here now instead of start time. So now these are minutes. So this is actually the amount of time. This is where we're applying the actual amount of water to our plants or lawn. So what we've decided is we need to water these, this zone for 45 minutes. So I'm going to hit this plus button and take us up to 45 minutes. Okay. And then on that screen, if you noticed previously, which we'll go back to after this, we had a, a second station, which were the fixed sprays. So remember the fixed sprays are put out water much faster. So we actually want to apply fewer minutes because there's a lot of water getting down at one time. So on this controller, we need to hit this right arrow. And now you can see it says station two. So on this one, we, we've decided we want to put in 14 minutes. 14 minutes. So now if we cycle back, we see station one has 45 minutes, station two has 14 minutes. Okay, so now we have two pieces, our two pieces of information. We have our program start time at 4 a.m. And then we have our minutes for each zone. So remember, we actually don't need a second start time in here. So you can see start time two is still blank because at 4 a.m. it's going to run both of these in order, station one, and then right after it'll run station two. Okay, our last setting we need to input into the controller is our set days to water. So you can see on this one, it has all these days to water. You say, okay, well, on ours, we decided we need to water um, two days per week. So we can select the two days. But let's say we want to water on an actual interval. We say, I want to water every four days because I have warm season grass and it's spring. You say, okay, well, how do we do that? There's seven days in a week. Well, on this controller, if you use your arrow and scroll past all the days and you can see it there, changing so we get to this screen 
interval. And you see that number flashing? That, that number is related to the interval. So that one means it's going to water every one day or every day. So what we want to do is actually take this out and say we want to water every four days. So what this, the benefit of using this right here is that seasonally, all you have to do, if you've got your run times down and you've got your start time set, the only thing you have to change for each season and each month is this interval. You're going to take it down or take it up. In summer, you say, I'm going to take it down every three days. And then in fall, you're going to take it up to every seven days. So this is really convenient when you are need to make changes at your controller. And then when you're all finished, all you have to do is turn it back up to run. This one, you're seeing, you're seeing it says no AC because it's just battery powered. But normally, you'll have just your time displayed here. Okay, excellent. So I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen here. And then I'll take us back to our other uh, presentation. Second here. I think we need to go ahead and make center. Okay, so now we are back on our, uh, so this is the program that we had input. And you can see that we've got our, our two days a week, we decided to do every four days. We started at 4 a.m. And for station one, we were watering 45 minutes for those rotating nozzles. Station two, we're watering 14 minutes for our uh, fixed spray. So um, in the interest of time, I'll just show you some other examples of what your program might look like, um, but we won't uh, go back and to the timer. Uh, unless we have some questions later on, I'd be happy to kind of go back to that and show that. So for shrubs, here's another example. If you have desert adapted shrubs in spring, we might say, okay, we're gonna water once every nine days or so. And we're gonna start that one at 6 a.m. And you can see we have pressure compensating drip emitters that are set to run for four hours. So you think about four hours, okay, what, what kind of drip emitters do you think that we might have uh, if we're running for that long? So if you look at the bottom there, maybe we have a, a one gallon per hour, or maybe a two gallon per hour. So after four hours, We've, we've gotten somewhere in that four to eight gallons down per plant, and then we don't have to do it again for nine days. If we have trees on a separate uh, zone, which is really nice, you could see that we can utilize program C, so we can look at different programs in your controller, so that way we can change the interval for your trees as well. And here's something that we talked about earlier. We have two start times. We have one at 2 a.m. and another at 8 p.m. Why would we do that? Well, you can see here we're running these drip emitters for three hours each. So maybe instead of running it six hours all at once, we decided we wanted to split that up, um, maybe because we don't have a lot of um, soil space, like in the picture on the right. Uh, so maybe six hours would be uh, too much at once, um, or maybe you have um, um, a really higher, a higher flow drip emitter um, that you can't, it's just gonna flood otherwise. Um, so. Uh, this is an example of how we can water um, and input that into the controller so that um, our plants and trees are getting the right amount of water. Okay, we already looked at the controller. So this is what that looks like when it's inside of your actual controller. Um, is you can see that uh, each program it has its own, essentially its own schedule, and we don't have anything overlapping. So I'll go ahead and stop here. Um, and uh, if, if people have some questions, I'd be happy to um, go back through the, through the uh, presentation um, or answer them. Um, so, Drew, feel free to uh, take it away. Thanks, Andrew. Um, I do have one question, um, and then I'll see if Connie wants to maybe ask them as well. Um, but the one question I'll ask real quick is, um, so there's a statement on page 17 of the Watering by the Numbers Guide. Um, it's uh, regarding the salt accumulation, um, and it still isn't clear to him uh, if it's intended to address, even if it's intended to address plants in the ground or not in containers. Um, could you could you um, explain uh, salt the salt accumulation and 
um, how to, I guess, leach the soils. And ex I guess you can explain how, when you water, you know, it goes to a certain depth and then how to leach those, the, those salts. Sure, sure, yeah. Um, yeah, so um, I don't have the guide in front of me actually, uh, but the, so the salt accumulation, I don't remember exactly what it says on the, on the guide, uh, but typically what they're referring to is you wanna water deep enough to push the salt away from the root zone. So as we talked about salt, uh, a lot of those salts are naturally occurring in our soil. Um, so if you have a plant or tree planted in the ground, um, a lot of our desert adaptive plants are actually pretty tough and they're resistant to that. Uh, so you don't have to worry too much. A lot of times if you have a uh, rock mulch, um, it might be happening underneath. So you, um, okay, Drew just handed me the, uh, the guide so I can see what you're seeing here too. Um, so what we're, what we're referencing here for everybody else uh, is talking about salt accumulation. Salt buildup may occur due to watering and evaporation cycles. Plants may show some salt burn symptoms such as leaf yellowing and leaf burn. Leach salts from the soil one or two times each summer by irrigating twice as long as usual. A good soaking summer rain might also leach the salts away. Okay, yes, that's a great point. So if you have plants in the ground um, and you are noticing that you might see that kind of white ring that's forming around the plants, kind of right at the edge of where you're watering, that is some salt accumulation. A lot of plants are pretty tough uh, and they don't necessarily mind that, but what you can do is what's called leaching. So basically that means you water the soil um, typically, you're just going to water it twice as long, so you can set your, your drip irrigation to water uh, double the time that you normally would. And what that's going to do is just push those salts deeper down um, away from the, the root zone. Um, you can do the same for lawn, too, if you're noticing that and you have a particularly troublesome area and you're noticing some salt buildup on your lawn. You could do the same. Um, oftentimes, in a, in a typical year, our rainfall does that for us. So it doesn't come up as often, though you might have noticed that last year because we didn't have any rainfall. So yeah, that's a great question. Sorry, I didn't understand that in the beginning. Um, and if you have plants uh, or trees in pots, typically this is not an issue because the soil is much more controlled. It's amended. It's not going to be high. It's, it can be high in certain salts, but not the kind um, that they're talking about here. Um, in terms of leaf burn, your sensitive plants are going to show that. Your high water use plants, the ones that are not really adapted to our area, those are going to show that more. Um, so you can try some leaching for those. It doesn't always um, work. Sometimes plants are just a little bit too sensitive and they might get burned just because. Um, but you can, um, you can try that if you're noticing and you have some sensitive plants and they have some, uh, the, some of their leaf tips that have been burned. You might see it on hibiscus and citrus trees. So in that case, yes, I would encourage um, if we haven't had rain in a long time, like we have now, go ahead and do a really deep watering. Typically just double um, your water time if it allows you to, and you might need to break it up like we talked about. And that helps to push those salts away. Um, and then depending on if we get rain again or not, you can do it again later in the year, or you might not need to do it again until maybe the next summer. But yes, good question. Um, let's see here. Um, sorry, uh, I didn't know I needed to, Sorry, let me I'm just going through. Oh, um, here we go. Uh, can you explain the placement of emitters in new trees? Do you place Do you place for expected mature canopy or adjust as it grows? Great question. In the longer version of this presentation, I have that on there. Um, if you have the guide, the landscape watering by the numbers guide, um, it's going to be um, on page four. Actually, um, it shows the placement of drip emitters. So. Um, let me see if I have a um, good picture on here. We can go back to one of these earlier ones. Um, I think on one of these I had with a picture of a tree. Okay, so for instance, um, the picture on page four is, is much better. Um, but yes, the placement of the drip emitters, you want to typically have it at the edge of the drip line of your tree or shrub canopy. So if you look at, if you look at your tree and shrub, then it's going to be somewhere right around the edge over here. So if you have any drip emitters that are really close to the base of the tree here, then I would recommend definitely moving those out further away from the plant. 
uh, because that's going to, uh, this is where the roots that are taking up the water are hanging out. Dairy here is mostly structural roots. You don't really want to keep that very wet because that's when you see rot, that's when you see trees fall over. Um, so if they're getting water there for too long, so you definitely want to move those out. As plants mature, it's not a bad idea to move them out even further. So on your drip lines, you can oftentimes just put an extension on there if they're still in good condition and move them out further if the tree or shrub has grown. Um, so it is a good practice to keep those drip emitters um, near the edge of the, of the drip line. So if you have a densely planted landscape, you might find that you have some overlap between your trees and shrubs where you have some trees, there's some shrubs under trees and you say, well, I guess they're kind of already in the drip line and that would be true. So um, you don't have to get super exact about it, but just in general, move your drip emitters away from the base and move them out further. And that way the roots that are taking up water are actually getting the water in those areas. That's a good question. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks, Sandra. Um, I don't, I'm sorry if you already answered this, um, but I just wanted to ask it because it's, uh, so it's going back to the salts again. Mm -hmm. um, so isn't the issue, the salt is in the water that is deposited into the ground and not the salt that already exists in the ground? That's a good question. It's actually just a little both. So anywhere, anywhere in the desert, all of our, anywhere in the Southwest, really, we, our water sources are, are for the most part, a very hard water. So um, it's, it, it's going to be putting, there's, there is some salt in the water in, um, but it's, um, it's also just naturally occurring in the soil as well. So it's a combination of both. Um, you might, the only time that it's um, really comes up as more of an issue is if you have um, depending on it, certain landscapes will use reclaimed water. Um, so oftentimes they have to manage it a little bit more closely because the reclaimed water might be a little bit more high in salts than your regular potable water that you'll get at your home. Um, but in general, all the water that we have here is going to be um, going to have uh, some salt uh, content. And when we talk about salts, keep in mind, we're not talking about when you think of like table salt or sodium. Um, it's, it's more going to be calcium, magnesium, things like that. Um, so those types of things, we, we say salt because it's still kind of technically a salt, but um, it's, it's not the kind where it's, it's not like we're adding seawater to our plant areas. <laughs> um, and so if you have water that's, that's too pure, actually because of our, so the, our soil makeup, the soil won't really be able to take up, the soil will lock up and not be able to take up the soil. And you could do this little experiment if you wanted, if you have an RO system in your house, um, and you could dump some of that water outside and see See if it actually is taken up in the soil very well, or if it just kind of sits on the top. Because if the water's too pure, then it, then the chemically the soil can't take it in, can't be absorbed. Um, so having water that's that's too pure wouldn't actually really help us very much. And like I said, the plants are, are pretty well adapted to those naturally occurring minerals in our water and in our soil. The problems that you'll see them more on those are on those sensitive plants. Um, but you are correct in that it's it's a little bit of both. Of, of the water. Um, yeah, the only time where it's more of a, a management concern is if there's some reclaimed water and that's being applied, um, then sometimes you have to be a little bit more um, active in doing some leaching, but not always. If we have enough rainfall, then you don't need to, get, need to do it even for reclaimed water. Um, so hopefully that, that helps to answer the question. Um, it, it, it Regionally, you'll have different issues with water. So if you're more in the East Coast, um, you might have more issues with um, uh, water, uh, different chemicals in the water, but it's not going to be salt accumulation. Um, so, yeah, it, that's just kind of the, the nature of, of where we are. And it could be your particular area, too, that you might notice it a little bit more. Um, certain, certain uh, you know, I guess you could say neighborhoods will have um, just generally a little bit higher salt content potentially than others. Thank you. Um, so this next question is kind of about um, it, it, I'm combining two of the questions. <laughs> they kind of okay. go together. Um, so they're asking, should they have multiple sets of emitters to accommodate for growth? And should they plan ahead for growth? Great question. So in terms of multiple sets of emitters, uh, that's probably more work than you need to do, to be honest, for your home landscape. Um, the only time that that would really make a lot of sense is if you had like a landscape that was really hard to access or you want it to be super low maintenance, think like a, like a freeway landscape where you want to have maybe run two sets of drip lines and then just, you know, change which one after the plants get a certain age. But in your yard, typically you don't need to 
to do that, it's maybe not really practical. Um, so in that case, um, what you can do is just, you can either move your drip emitters out um, a little bit further. Usually there's some pull on those lines. Um, let me go back to a screen that has the drip emitters on there. So you can kind of see, um, let's see here, the screen right here. So you can see that there's usually some pull on these lines um, and you can also just add a, an extension on it as well and then move those drip emitters out further as the plant ages. Uh, what was the second part of that question again, Drew? I'm sorry. Um, should they plan for growth? So I think they were just asking, like, should they should they basically have drip emitters, like, say it was a, a new sapling? Should they have the drip emitters, you know, closer to the to the base when it's younger, and then, um, you know, have a drip emitter that's maybe goof plug that's further out and plant it that yeah, way where they can. can Absolutely. Yes, that's another strategy you can do. Uh, what you, you mentioned, Drew, is yeah, because at the beginning, the roots of the plant, especially when it's first planted, are right here. So that's why you see those drip emitters plants are right here because they have to be, because that's where the roots are. So what you can do, uh, as, as you mentioned, Drew, is you can actually have, even if it's the same drip line, you can have another one out here and just they're all capped off. So, and then, yeah, once the plant gets to a mature size, um, then you can cap the ones that are close and then unplug the ones that are further out. Um, and then you could have that, that same line essentially um, and not have to do any digging. Um, that's a really great idea. If you plan on kind of being in your home for a very long time, that's really great. Um, it's, we don't see it as often in home landscapes just because um, of you know, people kind of moving, but also the practicality of a lot of times those things will get lost <laughs> um, under there. And so then it's like, okay, we want to, now that's been, uh, you know, 10 years and our plant's big enough, now we want to uh, find those old drip emitters. And then at that time, you're like, eh, we'll just replace the poly line. I don't know where it is. I can't find it. <laughs> um, okay. So that can happen as well. If you, if you have that kind of foresight, uh, that's really awesome. And you're planting a new landscape and you plan on being in the home a long time, then that's definitely a really great um, idea to do. And you can either do it as two separate lines or you can do it as, as the same zone just keep in mind that that every time that zone kicks on then that line is also under pressure so now you're essentially managing kind of two lines which can both of them can leak uh so just kind of keep an eye on it but yes that's a great point is the the main idea is you do want to have those drip emitters where the roots are and then yeah you want to move them or either have them already in place of where the roots are going to be when the plant is mature cool awesome. perfect um, uh, the next question I have is, do you have any recommendations for reputable companies that can work with me to fix my current irrigation? The last company I had replaced all my PC emitters with the adjustable ones. Sad face. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's too bad. A lot of times you'll, you'll see that because it, it gives the illusion of, of a lot of control. Um, the adjustable ones that they are, um, Thank you for that question. Um, sorry, I'm just scrolling to that screen so people can see if you're still watching here, which one we're talking about. Yeah. Uh, it is, oh, sorry, it was on the next one. Okay. This one here, uh, the adjustable one. So it gives the illusion of having a lot of control, but really it's really a pain because they're kind of, every time you walk out there, it's gonna be putting out different water than it was yesterday. And you'll feel like you're just constantly battling it. So in answer to your question about um, finding a reputable contractor, um, the best place that I can recommend is to go to smartscape.org. Um, and on that website, that's um, a lot of the uh, cities in the Valley um, work with that, um, that program. It's through the University of Arizona Cooperative Extension Office, and it's a training program for landscapers. And they go into depth into all the things we've talked about today and even more um, and, and proper desert landscaping and watering and irrigation. Um, so I would definitely recommend checking that website out. There's also a program they can go through that's called Advanced Smartscape that is focused all on irrigation and water management. So if you can find a contractor that has both of those, a Smartscape and an Advanced Smartscape um, certificate or a, um, has gone through both of those programs, then that's a really great place to start. But good question. That's a common problem. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Uh, let's see. Let me make sure. So yeah, I, um, I also, uh, in the q and I answered that question um, with with the smartscape.org that you mentioned, and then also the 
um, website to the Maricopa County Extension Office. So if anyone wants to view those, they can. Um, let's see. Uh, next question is I have many palm trees in my backyard, pygmy, mule, ponytail. Um, they were planted about five years ago. Nurse, the nursery recommended to run for two hours every five days, uh, two gallon an hour drip emitters. Is this too much? Uh, this was during the winter. When should this be adjusted for summer temperature? These palms are getting water by plants nearby on a different station Monday through Thursday for 45 minutes with one gallon an hour. Sorry, that's a loaded question. <laughs> okay, yeah, I mean, it's, a, it's a good question. Yeah, so a lot of people might have a similar experience where you have some plants that have gotten established and the last recommendation that you had that you feel like you could kind of go off of was the, the nursery or the, uh, the installer. So um, this is what I would point you to. Um, you can look at page nine in your book for some additional details as well, is take a look at how large your plants are. If they are, um, you know, if they're the tall palms or they're the pygmy palms, just take a, a glance and see about how much your diameter is. So I think, uh, what they say, two, uh, two gallon per hour uh, emitters as separate for five hours or something like that. Is that what it was? It was like two. The it was uh, for two hours every five day, two gallon an hour emitters. Okay, two hours. Okay, so if there's only one to two gallon per hour emitter on each tree, then if you do some quick math and you say, okay, two gallons per hour times two hours, so that's four gallons. And we look here at our plants, and if it's the palm trees, you can kind of categorize them as a tree, and you say, okay, well, if it's if it's larger than a couple of feet, if they're only getting um, four gallons, it may not be deep enough watering if they've been around for five years. Um, let's see, yeah, five years ago. So in that case, you might consider actually increasing the amount of time. Now keep in mind, if you is it one two gallon per hour emitter or is it two or three? So you're going to want to add those up. If there's you know two two gallon per hour emitters for each, that's actually four gallons um, an hour. So yeah, you wanna essentially figure out, okay, how big is my plant? And then say, how many gallons does my plant need based on that? So if your plant is, I'm guessing they're probably closer in this range, maybe four, four feet at least in their canopy. So you might be wanna get, get closer to that 15 to 20 gallon down for each watering cycle. So then you might say, okay, then either I need to add some drip emitters or I just need to run them for longer if there's only one on there to get a deep enough soak. Um, and then the every five days, uh, again, that's going to depend on the time of year. So let's go ahead and go to that screen, which I think I have in the how often right here. So if we're looking at those and you can say, well, there might be some high water use uh, trees in there. So if we're in spring, every five days, eh, it might be a little bit too frequent. So in that case, we're going to be watering maybe a little deeper, more, more hours now, but we can stretch it out because their roots are a little bit more established. Um, and then if they're also getting water, you mentioned by some other plants, which is very common, you have plants that are kind of overlapping, the zones are overlapping, something to consider. So that's why don't get too caught up in getting it exactly right, because you do have water being added to the soil in various areas around your yard. Um, so yeah, they're all going to be kind of sharing that a little bit. You just, you're, you're trying to get um, as close as you can to getting that um, proper watering for that specific zone of plants. Um, so you can have a little more control over it. Um, so on, on your other ones, you, it said a couple days a week, 45 minutes for a gallon an hour. So those plants are not even getting a gallon. Um, so in that case, if they've been around for a while, uh, they're going to need, if they're bigger than a foot, they probably need more than one gallon now. So you're going to want to start that process of watering a bit longer and then stretch out the number of days in between to help those roots to be more resilient. Good question. Yeah. Um, it looks like she commented on here that she has three excuse me, three two-gallon um, three two gallon per hour emitters. Um, so she's, I guess, running them trees. at six gallons. Six, basically, each of them are getting six gallons every hour. Um, oh, nice. And okay. they're 20 So that's actually tall. really good. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a great, so if you have six gallons per hour, so that's the kind of math you want to do. If you have plants that have more than one drip emitter, add those together. So like, like uh, you just mentioned, that's six gallons per hour. So you want to say, okay, they're running for two hours, so that's now 12 gallons. And you can say, okay, 
for your smaller shrubs and trees, you're actually probably pretty close to where you would want to be, especially if they're planted pretty close together. Um, and so if you have those other plants that are really nearby. Uh, so I would say that's actually probably pretty good. Um, the main thing you want to do now is just to uh, not water too frequently. So make sure those days are stretched out uh, in between and then just monitor and see how the plants are doing. Um, and then if the plants are, are growing quite a bit or they actually have a really large canopy now after five years, then um, consider adding um, an additional hour or two just to make sure you're getting a deep enough soak. Um, and you'll be able to tell by just monitoring your plant health as well. Um, and you can also, it's a little bit harder, you can do the screwdriver the test by pushing the screwdriver into the soil and see how deep you're watering. It's a bit harder for drip um, because it's um, because of the way it's you know not soaking the uh, necessarily an entire wetted area, but you can still try that to see if you're getting a deep enough uh, soak in there. But uh, yeah, great question. It sounds like you're definitely on the right track. Excellent. So the next question is, um, so that rate, uh, so what is the best way to provide water to a tree whose drip line extends out over concrete or asphalt? Um, I would imagine it's gonna be a little bit more important to water deeply um, just so that you get a better root structure since it can't, and you don't want the um, asphalt to be, or concrete be popping up, is that correct? Yeah, yeah, that's a very, very um, insightful uh, question and also a very common situation, especially in, in our home uh, that we see where a tree canopy is extended out over into hardscape areas. So yeah, in that case, I would, I would move your drip emitter uh, the best that you can. So if your driveway is, is, you know, only a couple of feet away from the base of the trunk, then try to just move those drip emitters as far away from the trunk as you can and soak the area that you can soak as best you can um, and still water as deeply as you can as well. Uh, but I would definitely, that's a, a situation, especially where you do not want to water too frequently because if the water uh, is, uh, if there's too much water in the soil for too long, uh, roots actually have a need for oxygen um, to, to, um, to do their processes. And so if they are essentially drowning, then they are going to be forced to find areas uh, where there is air pockets. And so the air pockets are going to start showing up uh, in your driveway cracks and things like that. Certain trees are going to do that more than others. Um, but yeah, you definitely want to try and water as deeply as you can um, and then kind of uh, give it some, some time off in between as well. Um, but yeah, there's not too much you can do when the roots are under there, but the roots are going to be going where the best soil uh, is for growth as well. So there might be some roots under there, uh, but they're going to be going there if there's, you know, water, nutrients, and air. But if, if there's hardscape, there's usually some ground preparation that was done there too. So it, it, they may not be going under there um, too much unless they're kind of forced under. So it depends on the tree uh, variety as well. You know, you hear about ficus a lot of times, or sisu trees are the ones that will be really aggressive with their roots. Um, so if you have a, one of those trees in those areas, you definitely want to keep an eye on it. If you have another kind of tree, like a, an evergreen uh, elm, um, those tend to be a lot better in those small confined areas and don't have the same type of um, aggression in their roots. Um, but yeah, it's a common problem here. The best thing you can do is just try to continue to water as deeply as you can, but still try and keep the water away from the base of the trunk uh, as much as you can to prevent rot. Um, and that will help with that longevity of the tree. Awesome, great, perfect. Thank you, Andrew. <clears throat> um, let's see. I don't think I saw any other questions come through. Let me see. I don't see any other questions coming through. Um, uh, but I do have a question for you, Andrew, and you might have answered this already in the presentation, so I do apologize, but I just wanted to, um, just in case, People came in and they didn't hear it. Um, uh, you know, I, I, um, you know, when I run sprinklers or if I see people run sprinklers, sometimes it goes into the street. Um, is there a way that I could better manage that water uh, without going into the street and down uh, down the gutter? Yeah, absolutely. So that goes back to what we talked about um, here about um, cycle and soap. So if you have, uh, let's say you do need to run somewhere in this range, 12 to 20 minutes, most people's yards cannot accommodate that much, that many minutes of sprinklers at once uh, because it will run off. It will go in the street. Even if you don't have a slope, it might do that. So the solution is 
I'll go ahead and um, get to that screen again, is you want to um, break up these times into smaller chunks. So I will go ahead and scroll to that here. I'm actually gonna be using, so right here, the cycle and soap. So if you have a long amount of time, you wanna break that up. So what you do is you, you decrease the number of minutes, split it up, uh, into even parts and then add additional start times in that program so that it's going to be watering at shorter intervals. You're still getting the total amount of water you need in that day. So you're still watering deeply, but you are reducing the amount of water that's lost from either ponding or runoff. The other benefit to doing this is that first water uh, application helps to kind of wet the soil a bit. Um, and open it up, if you will. And then by the time that second and third application of water, you're getting a lot better soak uh, into the soil, especially in our kind of hard packed clay and clay loam soils. Um, that is uh, um, definitely a good strategy to use, even if you do not have a slope. And even if you are not watering that many minutes, if you're only watering maybe 11 or 12 minutes, I would still highly encourage breaking that up. For drip irrigation, you can also break it up. It doesn't hurt to break up drip irrigation, especially if you're noticing you're having some areas of runoff, um, then it's still a good practice to do that. And it would be the same method. You would, you would pick the station, uh, break that up into smaller chunks, you know, at least in half, if not in a third, and then add a, another start time in that program. Um, and then when that start time clicks on, the timer sees it, and then it runs the program again, uh, which is exactly what you want in this case. So yeah, that's a good, a good question. I would definitely encourage that. It's better for our plants uh, as well um, for just our deep soaking rather than a lot of times you say, I can't water that deeply because it just all runs off. And so I have to water really shallow. So this is the solution to that from a programming kind of pragmatic standpoint is to water deeply and just kind of use the entire day, if you will, uh, to get that water into the soil. And I also want to just make a quick comment about, I saw some, some people were looking for the, the smart controller and like uh, the, how this would, this information would be programmed into a smart controller. Um, and yeah, I definitely encourage you to see the other presentations, uh, but that is a great point about um, this information that we talked about today, your plant type and sprinkler type. You need all the same information in order to put that into your smart controller. So you actually still need to know all of this information because when you have your smart controller program, you have to reference it against something and you want to see if the program is correct. So you actually want to look at the program and compare the program the controller thinks it's going to do to this right here. You want to compare it to the uh, watering frequency and all the things we talked about. Is it watering deep enough? Is it breaking up the start time? Is it breaking up the times into the cycle and soap? Am I getting enough days in between watering? So I would highly encourage you to look at your landscape watering by the numbers um, and to take this into consideration. If you have a smart controller, your ultimate goal is to get the controller to do all of this for you, but it still needs to do all these same things. So this is actually good information to know because you want to cross-reference the end program with um, what the landscape watering by the numbers recommend. Awesome. Thank you, Andrew. Um, so the next question is regarding citrus trees, um, which I know citrus or any fruit um, tree is going to be a little different than normal or normal plants. Mm -hmm. uh, but the question is, my citrus tree needs 30 gallons a day. It needs to be watered every 10 days. Am I supposed to give it 300 gallons in one day? I have a two gallon per minute bubbler and letting it run five hours would flood my yard. Yeah, it's a great point. So if, you, if you've gotten your calculation to your gallons that you need for your citrus, and that is one of these here that we talked about in your gallon. So yeah, your citrus tree is one that you're gonna wanna actually take in these high numbers. So yeah, if you figured out, okay, I need to get about 300 gallons down over a period of 10 days, but, and you have been applying it every single day because that seems like it's the only logical way to get it down, then, um, and you have bubblers, so yeah, two gallons per minute is pretty high flow. So you say, yeah, you can't, there's no way you can water that long at once. So um, what we want to do is use that same strategy, the cycle and soak, as much as possible to break that up. So let's say we have 300 gallons divided by 
two gallons per minute plus 150 minutes. And you say, okay, well, I can only water maybe 20 minutes before the basin overflows. So we say, okay, 150 minutes. I'm doing some quick math here for us. We'll divide that by 20 minutes. So we're gonna have seven different cycles of that. Now, if you have a irrigation controller, most of the time you're only gonna have an option for uh, three start times and maybe you'll have an option for four start times. So what you can do is you can do a couple of things. If you um, don't have a lot of other plants or you're not using all your programs, you can use both your B and C programs and add up to six or eight start times. So let's say there's three options for start times in program B, three options for start times in program C. You say, okay, well, I need to get my 300 gallons down uh, if, as much as possible as I can in, in t today, you know, or within a span of 24 hours or so. So in that case, you can set it to start watering at maybe at midnight, then the next cycle maybe is at, you break it up every four hours or so, right? And the next one's at four, maybe the next one's at 8 a.m. And then, and, and then you can go over to program C, still watering the 30 minutes or 20 minutes each time, but you're applying them in smaller intervals um, and giving enough time in between so that it's soaking in each time. And that way you can feel, you can get the total quantity of water down that you need to get and then still allow that spacing of, of frequency before watering again. Um, and that helps to prevent things like rot from the soil being too wet for too long. Um, and if, you, if you've been watering every day, I wouldn't recommend going that far at once. I would maybe start by training it, try every other day or every three days to start, uh, but do the same thing. You can say, yeah, there's no way I can water an hour on bubblers, it would make a mess. So break that up to three 20 minute cycles um, or even smaller if needed. Um, and if you really need to, and you can only run very short time, then kind of group your days together. So say, I'm gonna water my citrus tree um, over these two days, and then um, take some time off uh, from there again. The only challenge with that is on a controller, you kind of have to use the, the week schedule. So you'd have to say, I'm gonna water it on Saturday, Sunday, and then take the rest of the week off and then water it on Saturday, Sunday again. But still giving it that time off in between is gonna be better than trying to get water down every single day. So hopefully that answers the question. It's a good question um, about how to get that deep watering still. Um, and the answer really, the short answer is use your start times. There's a lot of start times in your controller. Go ahead and use those and break up your watering time. All right, let's see. So let's see, sorry, uh, is so is increased leaf drop by the ficus, um, the Indian laurel fig, indicative of insufficient water? Um, is the leaf drop a defensive mechanism by the tree to conserve its resources? Um, it possibly could be. Um, you do sometimes see those, those ficus trees lose some leaves when they are under some water stress, um, because remember the leaves are are where the tree is losing water um, on a to do its normal functioning. So, yeah, if you have a tree that is under water stress, a ficus tree, that is something you might notice um, that they're losing their leaves. So, in that case, if you're noticing it, I would give your ficus tree a good deep soak um, so that they can recover uh, because they still have all that root zone, the root area underneath that the tree is trying to maintain. So, it can't do that for very long, but it does have. Uh, some adaptation that way they can they're still pretty tough all things considered that's why you still see a lot of ficus around here um, they're you know they're still more on the sensitive side but they they can last quite a while um, one other thing that i'll see a lot of times with those ficus um, is if there's been some work done in the area if their root zones have been disrupted so if some new hardscape has gone in a new pool driveway uh, other kind of work because they do have a very extensive root zone if that has been done, even in the past, say, two, three years, you might be seeing the effect of that. Um, we see that a lot with citrus trees as, as well, um, where like there's been changes to the landscape. Maybe somebody had lawn, they took out the lawn, even though the tree wasn't in the lawn, and then two years later, the citrus tree is really struggling. So trees are oftentimes gonna be delayed in their response um, because of the seasonal and just the way they grow. So, that could be another consideration if you're thinking of something specific 
uh, think about if there's been work done in that area that has disrupted the root zone, or if there was previously lawn that was watered really heavily and now that lawn is gone, um, the trees may not show an effect for a year or two. But if that's the case, then definitely try to get some deep soaking down for those trees to help them recover uh, because they have a big root zone they're trying to maintain. Um, and so, um, yeah, that's a great um, point to bring up that um, any plants will will have some kind of adaptation um, in our area. So a lot of times you'll see plants naturally um, adapt to that. You're like, think about your brittle bush types where they'll lose their leaves almost entirely sometimes in the summer, um, but they're still just gonna come back with that first rain. Ocotillo will do the same thing. Uh, so a lot of plants, it's a natural thing. You don't have to worry about it if you're trying to have a really low maintenance landscape. Um, but for a more sensitive species, you do wanna keep an eye on them and, and address it. Uh, if you do see a lot of that leaf drop. Any other uh, questions out there? I don't know if you're speaking, Drew, but you might be on mute. I can't hear you. Sorry. Uh, so the next question is regarding citrus. Um, would you would you still have a basin if the tree drip line distance requires 300 gallons? Uh, if you're if you're a uh, good question. If you're watering with bubblers, let me go back to that screen uh, with the bubblers on it. So if you are using these, then the drip line is not so important because the water is being put out so fast. You kind of have to. Um, it, 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 you need something to contain it in. So um, if you have a basin, if you're using bubblers, um, if you're using drip emitters, you can have a basin as well. Typically your drip emitters, uh, the, the soaking into the soil fast enough that it's better to just have the drip emitters placed properly. But if you are using a really high flow of like something like this, then having a basin is better because then it's um, evenly spreading that water over the root zone. So in that case, yeah, you want to, if you can, if you have room to expand that basin, that's going to be better. Remember our soil type, um, I took it out of this presentation, um, sorry, because it's the shorter one, but um, I will reference, I'll go ahead, let me look it up on the page number here. There's a great graphic on the landscape warming by the numbers, which is page 13. So page 13 shows the soil type. And on the far right of that picture, um, it shows clay soil. And you'll see, you'll notice that the water is going to spread sideways quite a bit. Even, doesn't matter how the water is getting in the soil. So if it's a bubbler and it's filling up a whole big basin, there's gonna be movement once it gets in the soil, it's gonna move sideways. It's gonna move sideways first before it goes down. So whether you're using bubbler or drip, if you have a basin, that's not a bad thing to have. It's a good idea for, especially for bubbler to keep it contained. And then once that water gets under the soil, it will spread uh, sideways a bit. Um, so if you have room to expand the basin, I would say go ahead and do it. Um, if you don't have room, you know, you have other things in the way, um, then that's okay. It's still, you're still gonna get the benefit of spreading sideways um, through the soil because of the nature of our soil type. Awesome. We've got one, maybe two more questions here. Um, sure. What do you do with newly planted shrubs and how long uh, should they be watered? Yes, good question. So I mentioned somewhere in the presentation that um, the only time you really need to water every day is if you have new plants planted or, or new seed. Um, you know, uh, we're not talking about pots here. If you have pots, you may need to water every day, but we're focusing on plants that are planted in the ground. So yes, if you have brand new plants, um, especially this time of year, a lot of people might be planting new plants in spring. Um, it's the principles are actually identical. What you want to understand is that, let's go back to this, um, screen here that shows the gallon requirement for the plants. So keep in mind, you have maybe a really small plant, only a foot or so uh, across. So it doesn't need very much water when it waters. However, its roots are pretty shallow. Its roots are just gonna be where that pot was for a while until it can grow further. So we cannot go um, five days or seven days between watering when you just planted it because it's gonna completely dry out and that will, you know, then it will die. So uh, it's a great point that we need to take into consideration your age of your plant. 
um, and you're going to actually be watering it. You're still keeping to the same principles. You want to water to the depth of the roots, but in the beginning, the, that root depth is, is not that deep. And it is going to dry out pretty quickly, maybe in a day when it's first planted. So if you have new plants, usually they recommend um, you have an establishment schedule, if you will. Um, so for spring, you know, that might be somewhere in that 14 to 30 day range where you have watering almost daily, depending on the plants, uh, or it could be daily. Um, and then you're going to want to start stretching that out. So then you want to say, okay, now I'm going to water every two days. And then I'm going to water maybe every three days. And then as you're doing that, increase the depth of the watering uh, so that you are, um, you're still giving it the right amount of gallons. So for instance, if it's still only one foot, you say, okay, well, um, I was giving it, um, you're still giving it the right amount of gallons, but you are stretching it out um, as the plant is maturing and the root zone is expanding. Uh, but remember the plant is also growing. So if you have plants that are growing, you wanna increase that amount of time that it's running. So a lot of times you'll see installers will put like 15 minutes every day. Like, okay, well that's appropriate because that's, it's brand new. That's how they, they got watered in the nursery, <laughs> uh, the plant nurseries. But once it's in the ground, after a couple of weeks, you actually want to increase that run time, maybe now 30 minutes, and then maybe every two days, you know? So you're still getting the same amount of water down, but you just need to stretch it out a little bit to help those roots uh, to get more established, um, to help it be more resilient in your yard. Uh, but most often when you see new plants die, um, it's either from over or underwatering. <laughs> in some cases, it could be other factors. You know, you're always gonna lose a percentage uh, of, of nursery stock, but, um, if you're noticing like, oh my gosh, I lost all these plants, it was probably either from over or under watering. And you could tell when you take them out, if you had to take them out, okay, did you get some, were they rotted underneath? It might've been from over watering. Was that soil just like pretty wet? Uh, then they might've drowned. If they were pulled it out and it was just bone dry, couldn't even, you know, either you saw no evidence of water in that soil, then it might've been stretched a little too thin too quickly. Um, but yeah, you will be watering daily with new plants for a period of time, um, but not for a whole year or anything like that. So especially if you're buying a brand new home, you might notice that that's the schedule in there. You say, well, it's daily watering, I don't wanna to touch it, you know, it's under warranty. But as soon as that warranty expires, I would go ahead and change that program because you don't want your plants to drown. If they're getting daily water for too long, then they, they will uh, eventually die from having too much um, water out there. Awesome. Thanks, Andrew. Good question or a good answer. Um, so I think that's going to be it. Uh, we're run out of time here. Um, but I just want to thank you, Andrew, for an, an amazing presentation and an awesome just a wealth of uh, information that you provided uh, for us. Um, Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you all for attending. And Drew, if you'd like to, you can feel free to share my, my contact information uh, over at um, um, yeah, I guess you could you could just share my my personal email if you like. So if people do have some some additional questions, um, I'd be happy to kind of uh, to answer those uh, as best I can as well. So uh, thank you everybody for your great questions and uh, for your attendance today in this virtual fashion and, and kind of being patient uh, with me as I go back and forth <laughs> from the screen. Uh, but you've been a great audience. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you again. Um, do you mind uh, putting up that slide, the last slide? Um, oh yeah, that absolutely. Shows. Thank you. For more of that information. There it is. Awesome. Perfect. Thank, Thank you, you both, uh, Connie and Drew, uh, for organizing this and um, and uh, getting this uh, opportunity out for all your residents. Awesome. Yeah. No. Thank you. Um, and thanks everyone uh, for everyone that was able to attend our workshop today. Um, here you'll find our city and town websites for more information or resources, along with our contact information. Um, we do have a short survey after our class tonight. Uh, it will pop up once you exit the WebEx. Uh, we, we would uh, appreciate it if you would just take a minute to complete that um, so we can use it to improve our classes in the future. But uh, thank you again. Hope everyone enjoys the rest of their week.